Welcome to Industry Focus, a podcast that dives into a different sector of the stock market every day. I'm your host, Vincent Shen. Joining me today via Skype from Orlando, Florida, is Motley Fool contributor Dan Klein. Dan, great to have you back. How are you? Hey, Vince. Hey, Vince. How are you holding up? Uh, I'm holding up okay. It's a long day so far, but I'm glad you'd come on and record one last show with me. Uh, it's, uh, it's always a pleasure. Uh, so, listeners, my time with the Industry Focus team will end with next week's show. I think I finally got my tears under enough control to dig into Keurig Dr. Pepper ticker KDP. So, Keurig Green Mountain and Dr. Pepper Snapple announced in early 2018 that they'd be joining forces. Another huge deal for uh, JEB Holdings, which is kind of pulling all the strings with its control of Keurig, which it acquired in 2016, not to mention the many other businesses that it has purchased over the years, like Pete's Coffee, Caribou Coffee, and bigger chains like Krispy Kreme, Panera Bread, and Aubon Pen. So, in fact, uh, since the Keurig Dr. Pepper deal announcement, um, the company has already scooped up Big Red, a smaller soft drink brand, and then Core Nutrition, a premium water company. That was a f- f- over $500 million deal. And I remember at the time of this deal announcement, Dan, that we were a little puzzled by the decision <laughs> for these uh, two companies to come together. Uh, you're bringing a non-coffee beverage company uh, into the fold, but Keurig Dr. Pepper is now the third largest beverage company in North America. So there is some strength, I think, in safety in having that sort of scale. So let's bring uh, bring us up to speed, Dan. Um, if you had to get to some of the core strengths or what has jumped out to you about this combined entity so far, what is it? Well, I think it's become pretty clear in the beverage space that moving away from soda is very important. Yes. But beyond that, you want to diversify. We did a show uh, a few months back about the Coke Costa, which is a coffee company deal, which is a $5 billion transaction. It's becoming, if you're building all these channels, whether it's retail distribution, stores, restaurants, the more things you could pump into that, the better. So while, while Keurig, which is largely a home based brand, doesn't seem to fit. It is sold in stores. There is a commercial platform for it. So, it, it becomes this sort of, we don't know where American tastes are going to go. You know, it, it might swing back to soda. Canada Dry had a really good quarter. It might swing away from water, because people might realize they're paying a lot of money for water, which they have in their house for free. Um, so, this is really a company that covers a lot more bases. And while it's still only number three, and a relatively distant number three, it does give it a little more marketing oomph when it comes to shelf space or the ability to talk to some of these partners. You know, you're not going to start seeing, uh, you know, major restaurant chains switching over to the the Keurig Dr Pepper uh, soda and coffee platform, but at least you will see some retail shelf space and convenience store, and it just gives the company a lot more power to to negotiate there. Sure. So. To remind listeners and just give you an idea of the scale of this brand portfolio that the company has at its fingertips, and you think about, of course, there's Keurig, that coffee side of the business, um, in the name Dr. Pepper, but also names uh, like Canada Dry, Snapple, By Brands, which was a Acquisition pretty recent before they announced this merger, um, entering the healthier beverage space. A lot of these companies are trying to do that. So, in total, between owned and partnered names, the company has over 125 brands at its disposal. So, it makes for a pretty, I think, formidable enterprise. And Keurig Dr. Pepper actually reported its first quarter of results as a combined entity. So, Dan, what do you think? Are we seeing some of the promised? synergies or other deal benefits materialize? So, it's very early. But the good news is, we've seen a lot of these mergers. And it's very hard to pull off a merger without having some sort of disruption. Uh, We tend to see it worse when it's a technology merger. Frontier Communications, if you remember a couple years ago, was a disaster. But here, they've maintained their supply lines, and they're on track to save $600 million over uh, over about three years, that'll be an annual savings, and it'll come in at about 200 million uh, each year before they get to the total 600 million. So it really is a so far so good integration, and I think the company has to figure out 
what it's going to be. Uh, it, it's ended some relationships. It's added uh, Evian Water, which, which is a Danone brand, which sort of gives it a, a premium water play in the market. And this company, which will be about an $11 billion company, becomes a very attractive partner play because it doesn't have everything. If you're going to partner with Coke, Coke might have three brands. If you're going to partner with Pepsi, Pepsi might have the same thing. They might have two, three, four brands competing in your space. Carrick Dr. Pepper is a little bit more simple of a portfolio. There are some holes in it. There's really some room to bring in some other things and to grow what they do. Yeah. So, to give listeners an idea of the um, just that some of the headline numbers and performance from this uh, combined report uh, revenue. Oh, and I should add that all, all these figures that I'm about to use are pro forma adjusted essentially. So it's an apples to apples comparison for this um, quarter where it's a combined entity to the prior year as if it were a combined entity at that time. So revenue up 2.9%, $2.9 billion uh, over those pro former prior year figures. So again, uh, in terms of annual revenue, this uh, as Dan mentioned, this amount can be about $11 billion business. Net income up 19% year over year to $301 million. Um, and the way the company uh, reports for its business, it breaks it down into four segments. So in descending order by revenue, we have packaged beverages, coffee systems, beverage concentrates, and then Latin America. Uh, beverages. So the packaged beverages is, uh, I think, the core business where the company is producing and distributing its own drinks. It's some third-party brands. Coffee Systems is that legacy Cure Green Mountain business. Beverage concentrates is when they're selling these concentrates to bottlers and fountain customers. And then the last one, uh, obviously, their beverage fi- uh, business focused in Latin America. So the two biggest segments are packaged beverages and the coffee systems. So together, they make up over eighty percent. Of the company's top line, and I think drive a lot of the story uh, for the company. Any updates specific to those two segments, Dan, that you want to highlight? So, what I thought was really interesting. So, you and I used to cover Kering when it was a publicly traded company, and we'd look at the uh, the K cup sales as sort of an indicator of where the company was going. Yes, and there was a lot of thought. That that Carrick had plateaued, and that because of some of the environmental backlash, that there was really going to be sort of a slowdown. Um, and we see here that uh, K uh, cup sales were actually up three percent year over year in the quarter, and brewer sales, which kind of stunned me, were up eight percent. And that's on the strength of the company launching two new sort of uh, more functional. They make lattes, cappuccinos, without having to use a different pod. The company has struggled with that sort of go from the basic cup of coffee to go to the full latte cappuccino. If you remember, the view struggled. And now they have sort of a system where you don't have to buy anything special. You just have to kind of add milk, and it will make you those products. And consumers are really liking it. They also had success with a, a revised version of their Mini. And I'm, I'm looking over my my Carrick Mini is uh, just off camera here. Um, and the new one is much sleeker. It takes up a lot less shelf space. And consumers have bought, which I got to be honest, surprises me, because I've never particularly cared for the cup of coffee a Carrick makes. Yeah, I I will say that eight percent growth, especially for the volume in brewers, you know that is a nice uh, kind of long term longer term signal where they're growing that installed base of devices, and ultimately that's what they want because once that device is in your home, you know then there exists the potential for them to create that more uh, sustainable recurring revenue with the pods. And something with the pods too that they've changed is their way they view pricing. I think in the beginning they realized that uh, what they called a barrier to entry for consumers to their kind of whole Keurig system is the price of the pods being expensive, them having to deal with uh, lower price competitors, getting some public backlash from trying to lock out people using these third party pods but now they're approaching it from uh, from the view that they got to lower the prices make it more competitive and this recurring revenue um, will kind of speak for itself yeah and I think it's a case where they've proven that this is how Americans make coffee for the most part and it's a convenience over quality model you're certainly going to get the people like me who are still going to sit there and do pour over cups or French presses or or you know who knows what four hundred dollar brewer you might have but for the average office the average person this is the standard and the other thing that sort of staying part of this uh, JB Holdings family is is you're starting to see a couple more partnerships uh, within that family, and the ability to 
to roll in all those different coffee brands, Douay Egg Ver and Caribou, and I can't even list all of them. Uh, Pete's is, is, is one. So you're, the ability to, you have this in your home, and now JAB, Dr. Pepper, they can make all of these new deals to sort of keep it interesting. Uh, Tim Hortons is one they just partnered with. And, you know, that is the biggest coffee brand in Canada. So being able to sort of, you know, have that as your, as your flagship for that market should continue to push sales. Something that you mentioned, uh, I think, is part of the uh, for their packaged beverages business. You know, this increase in the number of partnerships um, and some success they're seeing with some of the brands that have existed in their or that are key parts of their portfolio. Um, some, uh, I guess, we would call it more organic innovation with Canada Dry, for example, seeing some real success in terms of the volumes and the growth for that brand, and. Uh, with the the uh, partnerships, what how do you think this plays out in longer term in terms of um, how Keurig will ultimately kind of be able to maybe gain on the bigger two competitors? Well, here's the thing: it is a challenging space, and mm-hmm. I, I mentioned to you before we we started taping that. Almost the second the Pete's distribution deal was announced, I started seeing Pete's products in my grocery stores, in in convenience stores in my area. So the good news is, Kerrig, because you cannot, as a grocery store chain, say I'm not going to carry K cups or I'm only going to carry third party K cups. So you you simply have to have a you know a pretty good selection, like you know like a quarter of an aisle devoted to just a wall of K cups. So that gives uh, Kerrig Dr Pepper leverage into saying, hey, we're already here. Can we have some shelf space for this? The challenge is that the the companies they're going against, Coke and Pepsi, are absolute masters in the shelf space game. So they will do. They will put money into it. Uh, they will they will put resources, people into making sure that they continue to have the best space, and that is a financial challenge for Carrick Dr Pepper to sort of make sure these Pete's beverages don't get uh, you know back shelf compared to uh, whatever Coke is distributing the, the Costa brand and various other products. Yeah, especially with you know the leader here, Coca Cola, starting to really make its move into coffee, and with that big deal that you've mentioned. So, something else I wanted to talk about uh, in terms of these different reporting segments, how they break down for the business, is with the with their profitability and contribution to the bottom line. Because um, interestingly, coffee systems and beverage concentrates actually lead the way when it comes to profitability. So, concentrates have a 61% operating margin, coffee systems 32%, whereas packaged beverages, it might bring in the most revenue um, for this quarter. I think it was about $1.3 billion out of the 2.9. But the operating, uh, the operating margin there just five percent. So something to keep in mind, and I think that this is just kind of the nature uh, uh, with, with the high margin behind producing and selling these concentrates, and the same thing on the coffee side, the high margins they can enjoy with these single serve coffee products from Keurig, and uh, how that contributes to their profits. Yeah, and selling concentrates isn't a sexy business. It's nothing we ever talk about with Coke or Pepsi, but it's very much like being a fully franchised restaurant model. Yes. So there's there's very little risk involved. If if the soda market declines by ten percent, yes, they'll sell ten percent less concentrate, but they're not going to have you know huge amounts of inventory tied up. They're not going to have you know sort of the systemic problems that their bottlers might have if they lose ten percent of their volume. So it's very much a pure profit uh, market and a, a sensible place. It's why you've seen Coke and Pepsi sell bottlers back and and no longer own control of some of that stuff. Yep. So let's get a little bit um, into the more kind of bearish. View of the company in terms of uh, what might hang up this integration, the combined entity. Uh, for example, uh, you mentioned earlier that management said they're on track to recognize these two hundred million dollars of synergies annually over the next three years for a total of six hundred million. I feel like that's the kind of promise that we see often with these big deals. Um, sometimes they materialize, sometimes they don't. Um, is there anything that worries you in terms of uh, the company achieving those targets? The only thing that worries me is it's while it sounds like a low number. So some of the companies we've talked about have projected billions yes, in, in synergy true. savings, but these aren't inventory manufacturing sort of rich 
companies. So like, yeah, you don't need two accountants. You can get rid of, you know, one secretary here and, uh, and uh, an office space there. But those do seem like pretty high numbers given the overall sort of size of the company and, and its operations. You know, you don't need, we were talking about concentrates a second ago. I don't know what the headcount is in that division, but my guess is there's not a lot of room to cut even as you, you know, sort of bring things together. Um, that said, the company has been very aggressive about paying down its debt. It paid off $550 million in debt in this quarter. Um, and that's going to bring bring down savings in another way because their their interest costs were a couple hundred million dollars through nine through nine months. I think 221 if I'm somewhere in the ballpark there. So you might not see the full 600, but I do think you will see a steady step down in expenses. Yeah, that was actually I'm glad you brought up the debt because that was actually the other um, kind of big red flag for me. Um, so Keurig Dr. Pepper has about 16 billion dollars of debt on its balance sheet. So uh, something to consider is that interest expense during the third quarter was $178 million. So that's a good for about a third of total operating income in that period. Um, and you mentioned $550 million of debt being paid off since the merger closed. They're still at $16 billion, which is a pretty big figure. Um, a common metric to uh, for considering a debt load is debt to EBITDA. That's earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. That figure is at six times. That's a super high mark for any company. And, but management has said that they want to bring that down to about three times over the next Two to three years, but I think that's a pretty tough, uh, tough thing to achieve, given that the company generated about 1.7 billion dollars of free cash flow in the trailing 12 month period. So there's going to be a lot of strong execution necessary for them to get to the point uh, that they're targeting. It is an aggressive target. I, I think you also have, you know, because you're backed by JAB. There's some cushion there. You know, there's th th this was sort of a way for JAB to sort of backdoor take Kerrig and make it public again without having to do an IPO. So this frees up some ability for them to have ca you know capital back in the coffers. But if there's a bad quarter, it's not like there isn't money to be had or money that can be pumped into this. But I I, I agree with you. It's a very aggressive pay down plan. Okay, so wrapping up then some final thoughts. Um, I know that a company in this category, uh, we talked a couple weeks ago, uh, Asset and I, about the idea of certain names in the consumer and retail sector as defensive plays in weaker markets, uh, you know, the con kind of consumer staples idea. I'm curious, uh, do you think that a Keurig Dr. Pepper can kind of play that role in that people still, you know, want their coffee? People still will have their uh, kind of soft drinks and other products that this company offers, even in tougher markets or a tougher economy? Here's the thing. I love the carrot part of the business. It's it's held up long enough that I don't see nobody else is going to come in with a, a coffee pod system that replaces it. So this is, you know, the Mr. Coffee for single for single cup. It, it, that's that's not going away. It's not going to change in 20 years. Years that part of the business isn't vulnerable to what Coke does, to what Pepsi does, to what Starbucks does. Um, I mean, we saw it. The Verismo, which is the Starbucks take on this, and I'm also looking over at my Verismo. It barely dented the market. It is a tiny, tiny shareholder. I I want to say last time we we knew this number, Kerrig had something like eighty percent of the U.S. market. Um, you know, not as much globally, but ro room to expand absolutely there. The part of the business I don't like as much is the. The, the, the soda, water, the part that directly competes with Coke and Pepsi. Because, yeah, Canada Dry is a nice niche winner, and that's probably the top soda brand. Dr. Pepper is the, the top for whatever flavor soda you call cola Yeah, the non-cola category. Non-cola brown sodas. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the reality is most of the top tier brands are owned by Coke and Pepsi. And Coke and Pepsi absolutely have the ability to freeze Carrick Dr. Pepper out of certain markets or make them a very minor player. So you, you, we've talked about it earlier in the show, you don't want to be on Coke's radar. Um, and this takes a company that was sort of a nuisance and maybe makes them a real threat. And you know that could be dangerous. Okay, so last point that I will make is that you know, given some of those growth numbers that we mentioned, three uh, percent on the top line, double digits uh, for uh, the company in terms of their net income, their earnings growth, uh, the 
current valuation that I'm seeing for Keurig Dr. Pepper uh, on a forward earnings basis. It's about 22 times. Um, so, in line with S&P 500, but also in line with Coca-Cola, right around 22 times as well. A little higher than Pepsi at 19 times. Uh, so, given some of those growth figures, uh, I'm definitely in a wait and see position in terms of uh, this integration and how thing. I'd love to see basically another few quarters of re reports for this combined entity. Where do you stand in? Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I, I like the coffee business, but for me. The fact that I don't like the coffee actually weighs in pretty heavily because <laughs> I I always wonder like when that's going to catch up and we we've talked about this with with the the pizza brands when are consumers going to go like hey this pizza I can get really quickly isn't very good and there's a pizza place around the corner that is pretty good um, so I do worry about that but I I want to see if they can be resilient in the soda brands if there really is room in the market for three players and maybe there is um, you know can they revitalize Snapple which was once an important brand it was once part of the name of the company and now it's very much an afterthought uh, so I, I'm gonna follow it but I wouldn't be buying it right now all right thanks Dan it has been a pleasure uh, I will miss hosting you here on the show uh, Vince, I'm trying not to cry. Uh, this is this has been one of the better experiences of my professional life. So I, I wish you luck in the the next chapter, and I'm looking forward to hearing all about it. All right, thanks, Dan. Thank you, fools, for tuning in. People on the program may own companies discussed in the show, and the Molly Fool may have formal recommendations for or against any stocks mentioned. So don't buy or sell anything based only on what you hear during the program. <laughs>